Thanks for coming. I'm Tom. Uh, Tom Igo. I'm, I'm one of the other founders of Arduino, and I also teach at ITP, uh, which is the Interactive Telecommunications Program at the Tisch School of the Arts at New York University. Um, I should say that this is the first time I've talked about any of this material and the first time I've ever given this talk, so I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth. Um, I hope it'll be interesting, uh, but I'm sort of musing in front of you here. Um, at ITP, as some of you may know, it's a two-year uh, graduate program where we give uh, students from outside of technology a hands-on introduction to developing interactive technologies. And uh, that's really how I came to know Massimo and, and Dave and David and, and the whole crew, because uh, what they were doing at Evrea was uh, also teaching physical computing, which was something we sort of made up uh, at a few places, ITP being one of them. And they were kind of teaching off my notes, and we all became friends. Um, I'm on sabbatical from ITP at the moment, but uh, this is what ITP looks like. It's a, it's a nice, open, crowded place with lots of interdisciplinary students. and. Um, it's a fun place to be because there's so many ideas sort of floating around. Um, where our work overlaps with ITP is this idea of giving people without formal training in computer science or engineering the capability to make software, to create digital media, and to design devices. Having said all of that, I'm not at ITP right now. I'm on sabbatical. Um, that's my office. That's my cat. Uh, and uh, really what I'm doing on this break is uh, trying to look at the broader landscape of what we do, uh, maybe to find some new directions, um, maybe to really understand what we're doing as a whole. This is kind of an interesting point for me. I, I started teaching physical computing in 99, and looking back on what's happened, I feel like we've, we've made some great progress, but we've also sort of plateaued in a way, and, and what I'm trying to figure out is where we go in this plateau. Um, one of the things I think we plateaued on is, is this idea of STEM. We talk about uh, science, technology, education, uh, engineering, and, and mathematics. And we talk about projects that are STEM projects. And there's a lot of push around STEM right now. And every kid's got to learn STEM. Um, and then, of course, the folks from arts come back and they say, but no, there's, there's, uh, there's also arts and expression. We should talk about STEAM. And, and so we got to do both of those things. And I say, well, talking about STEM versus STEAM, is a bit like that line from uh, the Blues Brothers movie where they go into the honky-tonk bar and they say, what kind of music do you got here? And the lady says, we have both kinds, country and Western. It's, there's more to life than just sciences and arts. And so that's one of the reasons that I, I called this talk uh, Humanities. But I don't think we want to call it STEAM. Um, <laughs> it's not really an appropriate uh, way of talking about this stuff. So we need, we need better language. And I think that the language we already have, it's called a well-rounded education. Um, I bring all this up and to give you some idea of some of the people that I work with in these areas. Uh, this guy here is uh, Anthony DeFiori. Uh, Tony's an anthropologist. He uh, is also a primatologist. He studies the behavior of monkeys in the Amazon. and um, he and I met many years ago because uh, I used to put at the end of my professional bio, Tom hopes someday to work with monkeys. And I did a talk uh, at a conference, and the conference uh, chair later introduced me to Tony and said, you two should talk. You both teach at NYU, have coffee. And Tony came over and looked at ITP, and I showed him all the cool things that blink. And he's like, well, this is really cool. I see a lot of things that blink. Why am I here? I said, well, what do you do? He said, well, I." study monkeys. I was like, that's why you're here, because I'm obsessed with monkeys. And we sat down over the course of that afternoon. We wrote three grants, and we started a research project together where my students, working as um, interaction designers, would take his students kind of as the clients and, and study how they study monkeys, study the physical conditions of what they do in the field, and try and understand what it is they needed in terms of tools and how we could improve that work. One of the refreshing things about working with the anthropologists, is that they um, need to be very good at math, particularly statistical analysis, to do their work. And we don't normally think of anthropology as a math-heavy field. We think of it as an observation field, one where we're looking at human behavior. But a lot of the work they do is creating what's called an ethogram, which is a protocol for describing behavior that they're observing. And that protocol has to be written in a detailed enough way that it the, after they've done observations on lots of different primates, whether those primates are human or monkey, 
that they can do a good statistical analysis of it. So anthropologists have to be good at math, but they don't think it's a big thing to be good at math. And it's something that I think we kind of need to look at because I think often in, in the STEM fields, we think it's, it's a big deal to be good at STEM. I think it's only just the starting point. And the, the question is, what, are, what else are we good at? So as I say, you know, Tony and his fields head out to the, uh, to the jungle, and, and this is a project um, we did in our first class. Uh, two of my students looked at his work and said, how do you know how old a monkey is? And he said, well, you know, we basically have to shoot it with ketamine, have it fall out of a tree, and measure it. <laughs> and that's not really a great way to do it. So we don't really know how old the monkeys are, except for watching them over years and years. You know, we've, we, some of these monkeys we've been tra tracking for 10 years. So every year we watch the monkey. We, a side note here, one of the ways they recognize monkeys is not actually by their face, but by their butt, because the monkeys are 30 feet in the air. And so one of the early projects we tried to do was take facial recognition software and modify it for recognizing butts, <laughs> um, which turns out not to be so successful. But uh, this project actually was fairly successful. What the, what the students did, the two guys there, one of them a mechanical engineer and the other one's a performance artist. Um, and they built uh, this rig that uh, shines a laser target on the animal out to about 50 meters, stays parallel out, out to about 50 meters, so that when they photograph the animal, it's painted with the target, and they could then use Photoshop to measure the animal um, without having to, to shoot it out of a tree. It was based on some work that one of Tony's students earlier had done, but didn't know exactly how to build the rig, and my students were good at making things, so it worked out. Um, it's, to me, an example of this idea of saying there are lots of things we know from various fields and from our own experience in past fields that we can apply to what we do now, and I try to get students to really understand that. Um, nowadays, I'm, I'm sitting here. This is the Brown Center for Innovation in Media at Columbia. Uh, there's a partner institution at Stanford that's the Brown. The trivial fact of this is this, this is Helen Gurley Brown of Cosmopolitan Magazine. So. Helen Gurley Brown is uh, funding data analysis in journalism at Columbia, uh, which I think is wonderful. Um, my, my colleague Mark Hansen runs the program. Mark's a statistician, and he's trying to teach the journalism students uh, how to better understand uh, large data sets, because so much of the reporting they're doing these days is really based on these very large data sets that we produce and that we don't always explain very well. And, um, it's a very different place for me to be at Brown than it is to be at ITP. Um, at ITP, the students are all from various different disciplines, and, and they don't share a lot of, of common interests. And uh, so that's great because they get to learn all kinds of new and exciting things. But one of the downsides I've found to an interdisciplinary program like that is that since their only shared interest is that they want to get better at technology, that becomes a goal. And so at some point, they stop being performance artists, as you saw with Arturo, and they start becoming programmers, or they start becoming technicians. And while I think it's great to know how to do that, I really want them to continue being the other things that they are. And one of the interesting things about Mark's students is that they don't have any desire to be programmers, but they want to be good at programming. And that's because they want to really be able to tell the story. And so when working with these kids, I shouldn't call them kids because many of them are professional journalists already. They are much more demanding of why it is I'm explaining a particular thing or why, how it's going to apply in their field. They're much more demanding on the ethics in particular because it's a big issue in journalism. Um, and it really changes the way I think about how I understand to teach programming. Um, oops, I skipped that slide. Um, we did a workshop there last month uh, about physical data because Mark's introducing them to uh, the R programming language and to all this stat work. And uh, the question they have is, where is all this data coming from and how are we getting it? So we sat down with a bunch of uh, Arduinos and uh, SD cards and sensors. And in the course of an afternoon, they went from zero to getting the data onto an SD card in CSV form, pulling it out and using it in R. Um, which was a fun workshop to do. Uh, it taught me, again, a lot about how I teach things and how I could teach things better. Um, because one of the things that I realized was that my model of what my code looks like 
and what it does, and theirs are very different. Now, I've spent a lot of time in working uh, with Arduino trying to make the code readable and all these things, and you've probably heard me rant about it somewhere at some point. And I thought I was pretty good at it, but it turns out not nearly as good as I need to be for these people. Um, one of the other interesting things about both these folks and, the, and Tony's folks is that they often describe themselves as stupid or ignorant or so forth when it comes to technology, even though they're incredibly fast learners, and many of them are very good at it. I'm not sure why that's the case, but I think it's something we need to look into really a little bit. I think it has something to do with that country and western bit where we think there's only two extremes of, of you know, science or expression, and I think we need to figure out how we describe the values in the middle so people don't feel like they have to be one or the other. Um, anyway, this is why I kind of got involved with Arduino, and it's uh, you know, what I'm trying to figure out over the time. So a couple of other points to this. Um, we've gotten very good at teaching media production the last 20, 30 years. How many people here feel like they can produce a reasonably good YouTube video? That's a surprisingly low number, actually. Um, how many people have seen a really good YouTube video produced by a supposed amateur? That's more like it. <laughs> because we've made the tools really good for that, right? And one of the things I think we've done well is we've produced tools that map to the way people understand what media is and how it's produced. Um, and I think it's something that we could really take a lesson on. We've also done this fairly well in some of the media manipulation environments. This is um, Isadora. It's a tool for uh, mashing up video and, and doing live video, VJ, and kind of things. And as you can see, it's, it's uh, kind of like a data flow programming language. You've got various objects, and those objects all represent functional things. There's a movie player, there's a video in watcher, there's a mouse watcher. I feed all of those into a video mixer, and then that comes out to a projector, right? <coughs> and so the, um, the mouse going back and forth made the mixing happen. Now that's, a, I think, a really handy way of thinking about programming when it comes to media, because it's a particular model that maps our mental model of how media work. Uh, there, of course, there are some data flow languages for other things. This is uh, a Quartz Composer, um, and it uses a similar model for building simple uh, web, top, uh, web, web tops, desktop and web apps. Um, but of course, it does hit its limits when we try to do things other than very simple operations. And if you've used any of the data flow languages like Max MSP or PD or Quartz Composer, or any of these, you've probably hit those limits. How many people have used data flow languages? Anybody? Good number of you. OK. So um, another one in the same line is, is um, uh, Node-RED. Uh, Node-RED is basically a data flow language for Node.js. Playing around with it a little bit myself, one of the things I, I kind of like about it is that, again, it's this sort of pipeline model. There's something at the beginning, my request, and there's something at the end, your fulfillment of that request. In the middle, I'm going to mangle a bunch of stuff up and finally give you back what you're looking for. That mental model is something that, again, works for transactions and works for media flow, but it doesn't work for everything. So of course, I said, OK, well, what other kinds of visual programming languages do we have? Well, the obvious answer is Scratch and, and block languages, right? And we've seen a lot of growth of these. These are very popular, particular among kids these days. Um, I'm not as fond of them myself, because I think what they do is they remove the syntactic complexity of programming languages. I don't have to remember the commas and the, and the semicolons and so forth. But they don't remove the structural complexity necessarily. I still have to think what's looped within what's looped, what's, what's dependent on what, and so forth. And I haven't got a good answer for how we remove that yet, but it is something that I'm trying to think through. How can we actually get to a point where we have a better model of the behavior of a particular tool or device? One thing I think that Scratch and, and Blockly and so forth do very well, though, is, <clears throat> and this example illustrates it nicely for me, you can see all of those different blocks are events. And events are something we natively understand when we think about performance. Right? We think, of course, something's going to occur, and then I want something to happen based on that. So by dividing it up in this visual way so you see a bunch of different events, you can go, aha, OK, when that happens, do this. When that happens, do this. When that happens, do this. It's a pretty good and popular mental model. And by popular, I mean something that people understand across a lot of different backgrounds. You see some of this a little bit in some of the automator tools. This is uh, Apple's automator. And of course, it basically is going to spit out an Apple script at the end. Um, 
There are not a lot of really popular automators, and I think partially it's because the only people who tend to automate are people who already know the command line. Um, but also because we haven't necessarily made consumer tools that make people understand that programs can talk to other programs and do neat little things, right? So I think this is an area we could do some improvement in. Um, back to that whole values thing, uh, I think we shy away from tools like uh, the, uh, the automators and the data flow languages and so forth sometimes because we think of them as not real programming because we're not writing a text file somewhere, right? But I think that's sort of like saying that film editing is not real unless we do it on this. This is a Steenbeck. Um, and if you've ever been in a, a traditional film department, you'll see various professors, particularly those who are a good bit older, who will demand that every student learn to use these. This is something going on in my film school right now. And Tisch is a fairly well-known film school. We produced a few pretty good directors, Scorsese, Spike Lee, people like that. And these are people who are saying, no, those kids have got to learn to cut film. It's like, well, no, they don't, because we don't use film much anymore. But we still use that mental model, right? So in a way, to say those kids have got to learn to write text is a bit the same thing in programming in my mind. We need to sort of say, OK, yes, that is a low level of things. But there are lots of different models we could think of that are computational thinking. And that's kind of what I'm looking for. Um, Yeah. I had a Frederick Jameson package, pa passage that went along with this. Um, if you wanted another piece of dense and un totally un ununderstandable language. Um, but my point here is that I see text-based programming languages in two large groups. One group is the math-influenced ones. And this is a, an example par excellence. You know, C and, and Java and so forth often look more like formulas like, than they do like instructions. And I think that works well for people who do tend to think in formulaic ways, but it doesn't necessarily work for some of my journalists or for some of the other people in, in anthropology or people who tend to think in more verbal ways. My wife is an interesting case of somebody who can do both, and so every time I bring these arguments up, she's like, oh, they both make sense to me, which <laughs> she's smarter than me. Anyway, um, the other class are the, the more verbal languages, the X-talk languages, Apple talk and HyperTalk and so forth. And I find these interesting because they're linguistically expressive, right? They, they let you think in language-driven ways. And I think the fact that, for example, you have infinitives in there or you have uh, adjectives and so forth and prepositions, they actually do let you think in, in what we as programmers call pseudocode. And I think for people who think in a verbal way, they're actually very useful languages to learn. Um, and I'd like to see some of that in other places, too. Um, That's a blank slide that I forgot to cut. Um, oh, no, not quite. We're going to talk about programming tools here. So um, I tend to sort of layer these out a little bit. At the very bottom, of course, we've got our assembly languages and instruction sets. Uh, below that, we get our compiled languages, right, C++ and Java. Uh, and this is, I think, everybody's way of looking at it, right? We go to the scripted languages above that. Um, I tend to not know where these fit in, but I throw them in here because they seem to fit there as frameworks, things that aren't real languages, but that are uh, wrappers around languages. And I class, you know, Arduino and wiring and so forth in that too. Um, processing, P5, Jails, Renat, Sinatra, they essentially make a language easier. One of the questions I'm trying to work through a little bit is why do we need frameworks? Doesn't that mean that the language itself just wasn't designed well enough? And then I thought, well, no, Matt, that, maybe that's not the case. Maybe what frameworks are doing, and I think processing is an example of this really well, is they are attempting to give you a subset of the language that matches one particular group's idiom. And that really does prove the point that there isn't just one way of programming. In fact, all these different idioms are, are equally important. And translating between them, I think, may become the primary skill of the 21st century. Uh, and of course, above that, we start to get the visual programming languages. Um, and then finally, um, the scriptable media authoring tools. And I miss Director, I'll admit. I, I still love to see things that did things quite as well as that. And then there are things that I don't know quite what to do with. But they are definitely programming environments. And they are definitely going to affect our future. Uh, Redstone in, in Minecraft, uh, there are kids learning. How many people are Minecraft people here? How many people who are Minecraft people here are over the age of 21? OK. Um, 
again, like an unusual group. I, I think it's awesome. Um, but, you know, you know, here's an Arduino that is built in, mine, in Minecraft and fully programmable, right? Um, and it was built using something like this. That's kind of messed up. At the same time, it's kind of amazing. So it's an entirely different way of sort of seeing programming that we're going to see influencing the way we start to program professionally soon, too, I think. Um, so looking at all these, I still feel like we're fairly primitive. And I, I mentioned the, the, uh, the code um, that I did for the journalism. So this is the code that I had written to, to do some of the data logging for journalism. And I tried to make it nice and clear and put my comments in and so forth. And I was pretty proud of this piece of code when I wrote it. And then um, they said, no, 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 we want this. I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. That, that's kind of what we're doing in this program, isn't it? Right? But as of yet, we don't really quite support this in language as well enough. So this is kind of a goal I see needing to go towards, both in my own coding style and in Arduino itself. I'd love it at a point where we can do a loop every 10 minutes, but eh, not quite yet. Another tool that I think is really interesting, back, back on the, the programming uh, tools, uh, the, the data flow stuff, is what Paul Stoffergen's done with uh, his audio design tool. I don't know if anybody's seen it. He made a really nice audio library for the TNC and for the, the uh, ARM boards, but it is incredibly complex. So he built a data flow language. And what the data flow language does is it writes your stub code. So once you get through all the stuff that you don't want to think about using the data flow language, you then get to write a text-based uh, program. And I think that's a nice model, because it, it takes advantage of what both do well. First, you work through the sort of BS, and then you work through the narrative. And I think that's really a, a useful way of thinking of it. As I say, in microcontroller land, we're still working on some of the stuff. But some of this is things we've been doing for a long time. I've been waiting for scripting languages in uh, microcontroller land for a long time, yet the basic stamp was doing it when? In the 80s, 90s? Right? The BBC microbit is now doing it in four different forms, and it's using the same processor we're using in the zero. And they're actually doing it pretty well. Uh, this is the, the JavaScript environment, and you can see that it starts off with a very blockly kind of style to things. I can sort of put in my values and so forth. It gives me a lot of scaffolding to learn the thing. And then if I choose to, I can be uh, done with that. I can see the, the uh, visualization of it. And then, of course, on top of that, it also kind of gives me a chance to say, well, I don't want it that complex. Let me see it without the images. Um, let's give me, get rid of the styling. OK, just show me the raw code. So I can work my way down gradually to a text base if I want to do it, which I think is nice because it does, it's more agnostic. It says you don't have to be one or the other. You can kind of do a bit of both. And there are times when you need that. I can see many times when I know part of the functions of a language, but not all of them, being able to have a tool that fills in those would be really nice for me. I'm also fond of Esperino, which is the JavaScript engine for uh, for the Cortex-M4. One of the things I particularly like about it is since it's node-based, I can do things like this, loop one, loop two, loop three, which is a way I find many students tend to think. They tend to think, I've got three different things happening at three different rates. Why can't I just write things that let me do three different things at three different rates? Well, you can. We just haven't provided the structure underneath to do it yet. Uh, and of course, then there's Python. And one of the great things about Python is you can import everything and then just be done with it. Uh, MicroPython actually does a pretty good job of this. This is how to make a mouse from an accelerometer in MicroPython. Uh, I think that's beautiful. I think it'd be more beautiful if they used full words, but it's, it's pretty nice. And another one that doesn't get nearly enough credit, probably because it runs only on Windows, is Logicator from Pickaxe, where you can actually write in a flowchart. You know, that's, that's actually something really nice. And I thought that flowcharts were something that only those of us from technical backgrounds really get. But then I started showing it to a bunch of the, the journalists and to, to um, other writers. And they're like, oh, no, that makes perfect sense. That's how I do my story arcs. I'm like, oh, OK, great. So worth looking at. Dave stole my thunder on the next one. This is uh, Bjorn's uh, PhD thesis, I think, uh, exemplar. And uh, again, you can see this idea that Dave was mentioning of saying, let's train the thing by showing it a pattern and having it recognize that pattern. Uh, I'm really pleased to see that that's starting to develop into something real now. And I think that will, to me, be the future of a lot of what we do. So I'm very, very excited about what Dave's up to here. What we don't have yet, though, I think is a framework to think about defining the de behavior of a group of devices together. And we're going to need that. Obviously, we're trying to do that with Arduino Cloud. But even so, within that, I think we're still using a model that says, program each device as an independent thing rather than as a group. Closest example I've seen to try to do that was uh, Luminet, which uh, Bjorn, uh, not Bjorn, um, Jan Borchers did many years ago with his, his folks in Germany. 
The idea was essentially programming by infection. You'd program one of these devices, they were all hooked together, and that program would infect the other devices with the same program. Now, when we can start to think about infecting and mutating, then we get some really interesting programming going on. We also get something that's a terrifying nihilistic world. But uh, I think done right, it could actually be kind of interesting. And you know, that's the beginning of the Andromeda strain, I know. Um, I think another way to approach it is, is again, through lang language-based boils in a slightly different way. If you look at this, what I'm saying is, what if we st were able to write sort of hypertalk for microcontrollers? OK, it might look something like this, right? But what if we were to do hypertalk for a bunch of microcontrollers at once and we could do things like this? Tell one controller what to do, but tell all the controllers that if any of them say something, that's what they should do. I think that kind of model is something I'd like to, to move towards or see somebody pull off because it's a way of saying, yes, I'm programming the behavior of this one thing, but I'm also telling you as a group what to do. And I don't differentiate between those two. And I think that's something important to consider. Now, I told you that uh, this presentation didn't have a conclusion, and I want to deliver on that. So there is no conclusion here. Um, <laughs> but what I want to do is kind of open the floor both to questions and comments and hear what you've seen that you find particularly cool or surprising in this space and where you've seen somebody with a different cognitive style influence uh, your work. So thank you very much, and let me stop there. Hi. Um, uh, one of many observations that I could talk about is the multiple languages and frameworks is interesting because uh, especially when you speak to people who are more great than me, they got into computing not because they wanted to learn about computers. They got into computing because, boy, they needed to produce uh, numbers for their physics simulations or something and later on decided this was more fun. But yeah. that was a tool, not, a, not an end goal, right? Mm -hmm. And what I found these days is there's a lot of that people get scared off because C looks cryptic, right? And it's not, but that's my personal opinion. Um, and a lot of people pick a programming environment or language because it lets them get over that initial hump of like, how do I get something to do something? And then everything else is mostly the same. I mean, all programming, all imperative programming, like all, all single threaded imperative programming languages are, are all the same, right? Mm -hmm. Once you learn the basics, the concepts are the same and it, it was more a cognitive jump to I can do this versus like having to like slog through learning the syntax. And so a lot of what you talked about there was, was reminiscent of that where like most of the time trying to help people program is getting over that initial hump of how do I make it do something interesting? Oh wait, I can actually do this and not getting bogged down on the wait, my Linux doesn't work well with the Arduino serial driver and off table flip. And mm. so um, I still think there's a lot to do there, like a lot, there's a lot there, there are 20, 30 different ways you just covered in skinning the same cat and they all appeal to a different subset of people trying to solve a particular problem and mostly it's just getting, them getting over that hurdle and I don't think that anyone's really done it well, yeah. right? Um, but the, 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 the final thing I'll mention is, is that um, the cloud stuff is, is interesting. Um, how, do you or anyone else have any comments on getting people to play well together. Because a lot of the problems that I've faced as a developer is that every vendor wants to own that ecosystem. Yeah, and including, that's a including the Arduino-ish startups who will have JavaScript running on their kit. As long as, and it all works well as long as you stay within their ecosystem. And the, if you want to interoperate with something else that's not a web browser, it doesn't work. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't have an easy answer. Uh, first of all, the, 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 the multiple skinning thing, I agree with you on. In fact, I actually think that's a good thing. But in the same way that we, uh, that the generation after me had damn well better be bilingual at least universally, I think the same is true when we think about computational styles. Because something may get solved in a language, in a domain specific language from some other domain that could be borrowed into another language. I don't think we need to have one universal there. But in terms of the net uh, citizenry, uh, I think what you're talking about there is the idea of a civics of the net, in a sense that we set some ground rules for what we consider to be good behavior as a whole. Now, the problem with that, particularly in the US, is we're not even good at a civics of people right now. So to expect that we might get that right on the internet is, is, a, is a tall order. But I think we can do it. And I think we've seen some examples. Because for all that has changed over the last 20, 25 years, we're still using HTML. And it still works pretty good. Mostly. 
Mostly, well, yes. I, I was around when multiple HTML uh, incompatible implementations proliferated and it made my life hell. Yes, and so was I. But, but what I'm getting at is that it, uh, it and HTTP are still mostly open enough that people can comprehend them as opposed to some of the proprietary frameworks you're talking about. So I think we have to look not at what is the perfect example, but what is the best example we've got to work with yet, and look for more of those examples and say, behave more like this is an ideal. Uh, but I should leave room for others, sorry. Yeah. She's got me right there. Um, I know the uh, last, uh, last speaker brought up the issue of kind of like a single-threaded uh, programming model. And I know with uh, the ESP Duino slide, you were showing kind of a multi-threaded one. And uh, one thing I've noticed is that a lot of uh, new developers and stuff are kind of in the single-threaded mindset and uh, not really able to move towards that multi-threading kind of thing. Is there any plans for more support of like multi-threading and real-time operating system to make uh, maybe Arduino a little bit more intuitive? Uh, there's no such thing as intuitive. Um, <laughs> but yes, there is a real-time operating system on the 101. In fact, it was just opened up uh, yesterday. Uh, and I think I can't say, say for sure in terms of our plans. Uh, Massimo is looking at me and I'm looking at him. But I think we can say our ideal is to be able to, to do more. Um, but I can't promise that we're going to do that. But the fact that it's there and you can try it out is, is certainly something. But to that end, I think another point I'll bring up. You ever taken a dance class? OK, take one. But second of all, in a dance class, you do, usually don't dance well the first time. And you can't pull off complicated moves at first. You do one thing at a time. So I think the fact that we tend to learn in a single threaded model first in a programming language is a bit like that. We need to sort of understand one concept, then we link it to another. So I'm not afraid of the fact that we have single threaded, but you're right that we do need to be able to do multiple threaded. And not just with Arduino, with all devices, I think. Uh, this guy had a question. Yeah. I like your approach of trying to find languages that are, are better fit our mental models, or at least different people's mental models. Um, it remind, I'm not from Berkeley, but it reminded me of a talk I heard here by someone on the Berkeley faculty whose name I don't remember, um, who was looking at the sources of programming errors. And it was a similar approach that these are the things that are hard for people to wrap their mind around, like scope, for example. Um, and he was trying to come up with a language that didn't have as many of those difficult properties as possible. And I'm sure someone in this room can probably tell you who's, who was doing this, and you might find him interesting to talk with. Cool, thanks. I'll look that up, definitely. Um, it's, it's really interesting that you brought up the um, flowcharts, the ancient flowcharts, and that you found that uh, the journalism students actually felt, felt comfortable with that. And it made me wonder, what, what are other systems that non-programmers use to sort of plan out an activity or plan out, you know, you know I'm thinking of structures that, that we would tend to think of as flowcharts, but something that, that other people, other disciplines would use for that kind of information, for that kind of planning. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's where anthropologists are really good people to know because they basically study how people do that, right? Um, and one of the things about the flowcharts, I actually think one of the reasons more, particularly younger journalists, get flowcharts is because it's something that's gone from being domain specific to being part of the popular imagination, right? You think of that flowchart that was running around Facebook the other day of, of who to vote for. I don't know if you saw it, but it was sort of like, do you believe in God? Yes, no. Do you think the world's messed up or not? Yes, no. Do you think uh, the rich people messed it up or not? Yes, no. And it sort of broke it down to the four candidates as to who to vote for, right? It was a flowchart. Actually, it was a decision tree. But um, that's something that has moved out of, of domain-specific knowledge to being something we all know. And it actually gets to something uh, the gentleman next to you was saying a second ago. I think uh, one of the challenges we often have in our own discipline is we, we, it's hard-won knowledge what we know, our experience, and we don't often want to let that become something cheap and free. But it's actually something we've got to get good at to go, just because it was hard for me doesn't mean it should be hard for you. In fact, my goal should be to make it easy to learn the thing that was hard for me, 
right? So in terms of other things, well, obviously in design, you've got the, the ubiquitous post-it notes and people, way people use things like that. There's uh, body storming and brainstorming exercises. There's the, what's his name? Uh, conceptual blockbusting book. Uh, it's got a whole bunch of them. No, not but De Bono, there's another one. Uh, James, somebody or other. Stanford guy. Um, but yeah, there's, there's tons of them. And, and sort of pick any, any anthropologist that's done some study of, of work and cognitive models, and you'll find quite a, quite a few. OK. Other questions? Other thoughts? Other observations? OK. So, so, so this sounds like a joke, but it's not meant as a joke. You mentioned the, the, the appearance of uh, the decision tree in Facebook. I wonder if any anthropologists are looking at things like Facebook to see what are the mechanisms that... Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, there's quite a few. In fact, uh, sort of net anthropology is a huge field right now. Um, and there's some really interesting crossover people, one of whose name I cannot remember to save my soul. She used to be at Intel, now she's at Goldsmith. She'd done a lot of work basically looking at technology uh, communities. And one of the things she said is, we've used 50-year-old uh, techniques in, in industrial ethnography for a long time now. What anthropology itself is doing is more things like subcultural studies. You know, we get uh, queer studies and race studies and things like that. Those are actually the, the, the uh, models we need for studying the kinds of things we're talking about here in her mind. And I wish I could remember her name so I could do the attribution right. But if you mail me, I'll try and find it for you. Um, but besides her, there's a lot of people. There's the, the uh, Association of Internet Researchers Conference, AOIR. There's a lot of uh, really good groups that are essentially looking um, at the net in terms of cultural mechanisms and dynamics. Yeah. Mike, behind you there. Is there a Scratch-like uh, environment for Arduino? Well, there's Scratch for Arduino, yeah. Okay. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's also some stuff that Dave's work. Dave could actually talk to you about that more since he was a lifelong kindergarten group before here and has done a good bit on Scratch. Um, he's really probably the ranking expert on Scratch in the room, I'd say. Sorry, Dave. Didn't mean to send you bodies. I've seen that there are two ways to approach learning um, programming language or uh, learning programming in general. You mm -hmm. can uh, start uh, uh, top down, maybe algorithm plus data structures, or you can just try to solve problems looking at, at the example. And the, the way you solve the problem is uh, looking at 100 example and select that one that is uh, well done, that is uh, very close to what you need to solve. So my question is, um, uh, it is good for the uh, young, uh, young kids uh, to start uh, with one or the other, or there is some balance in between. What do you suggest? Do you see a risk in going too much into an example analysis kind of thing? Or it is, uh, um, I don't know, I'm trying to understand, it's better to, to start top down, or it is better to start bottom up, or it is better to try to do a little bit of both? That's a good question. Um, my personal uh, preference is for starting with the application and, and who it is, is it that you're trying to solve a problem for and what are their needs and what are the con what's the context of that need. So that often means needing to learn a particular technique that maybe somebody else has found or finding the case that matches it. Um, so that would be my preference. I don't think it's necessarily the only method, but of the two you've mentioned, that would, I, I would lean that way, I guess. Uh, is there a danger to the other one? Yeah, there is one danger. There's the, the hammer and nail problem, right? If, if I introduce you to a series of uh, examples, and this is, I think, you know, sometimes a, a both a strength and a weakness of things like Arduino and processing, so I introduce you to an example, you're going to think that every problem is solved by those, that set of examples. And in fact, you can look at the types of projects that come out, and one of the, the, the things that I think that's happened over the years is because we've written examples for particular types of problems, people have built those kind of projects over and over again. And um, there are other types of problems that I know of that people haven't built solutions to, partially because nobody's got written the beginning of a good Arduino or processing or whatever example for. So I think that's, that's one of the dangers of going the example route. Um, but ultimately, hopefully that danger is addressed by working with somebody who has a real problem. Because when you do have a client, when you do have somebody you're working for, they're going to say, no, no, that doesn't solve my problem. 
and then you've got to go back to the drawing board. You know what I mean? Cool, thank you. That one over here. We should probably take one more and then stop because I can see we're getting close to time here. Uh, yeah, I'll just jump in here. Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about uh, during your talk is that you said there's no such thing as intuitive, mm. uh, but yet there are abstractions, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's got one, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, to consider all these different methodologies of you know, solving problems with computers, I mean, it's clear just from the you know, 15, 20 examples that you showed that there are you know, totally different types of abstractions or levels of abstraction um, what I wanted to say is that um, what I find um, interesting about our Ar Arduino and microcontrollers and stuff is that you have the capability of writing programs in a way where you get feedback from these different types of things, which I think really removes those abstractions, which allows uh, people to realize the tool base value and try to see the end result m a lot more clearly. So I, I, I think that's really interesting and, and anything you'd have to say about, you know, uh, if you could elaborate in that context about why your programmers say, or your, your students say they don't really want to be good programmers, and then also juxtaposing that with the idea of, of thinking about the application first, you know, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that. Sure, and to, to clarify, I said my students, or more specifically Mark's students at, at Brown, don't want to be programmers, they want to be good at programming. And what they're saying by that is they, they self-identify as journalists, as people who report what's going on in the world and analyze it. And they want to continue to be that. They wouldn't continue to self-identify that way. They don't want to shift over to being people who uh, self-identify as solving a problem through software, hardware, etc. Okay, And I think that's actually legit, right? In the same way that if I, as a programmer, said I don't want to become a dancer, also legit. Actually, I do want to become a dancer. I'm a terrible dancer, and I'd like to be better at it. Um, obviously, I've mentioned it like three times. Um, I'd taken a few dance classes, and I'm terrible at it. Trust me. Um, but just like the fear of programming, the fear of dance is just the same, because you don't want to look uncool in front of the other people in the room, and somebody else in the room is either going to be a better programmer or a better dancer than you. And what really sucks is when they're both, <laughs> which is, in fact, the case with one of my colleagues. But um, back to your question, sorry. Um, the abstraction thing, I think you're right. I hadn't thought about it before, but abstractions do kind of uh, imply a certain intuitiveness, right? When I think of intuitive, intuitive means I assume that you and I share the same background on this and the same point of view, and therefore, you're going to pick up immediately what I'm saying. But that only works when we do share that background. So intuitiveness, when I say there's no such thing as intuition, I mean that all intuitions are learned in some cultural way. Um, and I think you're kind of blowing my mind here, because you're right that the abstractions we use actually form those intuitions in a way, in the same way that, say, Windows icons, menus, and programs have. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, I don't have more on that, but I got to think about that. That's a really good point. Thank you. Um, anyway, we should stop there, because uh, I know that we're out of time. So thank you very much.